God, for his grace and strength each and every day for the trials and the troubles that we face. We find the consolation of faith in his word, and we're looking to God for the strength that he gives until we reach the promised land. That was the attitude that Peter had we saw last week. If you turn with me in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1, when Peter spoke of his decease, he used the word exodus, my departure, because I'm leaving to go to the heavenly land. Peter was looking to meet his Savior in heaven. Are you looking for that? Are you looking for that heavenly land? There's going to be a joyous gathering in heaven one day around the throne, around the glassy sea. And until that day comes, we do seek God's grace day by day to serve him faithfully. Amen? May God help us and may we be careful. May we be careful to look in the source that God has given to sustain us until we get there, the word of God. Would you join me as I read? I'm going to read, if you'd follow along, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 15 down through verse uh, 18, 15 to 18 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, and who, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way you honored your son, Jesus Christ, when he was here, speaking from heaven, not only to identify, but to glorify Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that Jesus Christ brought glory to you in the way that he fulfilled all your purpose and will going to the cross, there dying and rising again from the dead, bringing glory to you, Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, bringing glory to you who are the author of salvation. And Father, as we look on the pages of Scripture this morning, may our hearts be encouraged and blessed by the reality of what we have in our hands, the Bible. The Bible in the English language, thus saith the Lord, that we might read, that we might know, that we might study and obey, that we might memorize and meditate and grow in the present truth you've given to us. We give our thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We saw last week that Peter and the apostles understood that God was using them to complete his only book of Revelation. God used the Old Testament prophets. Peter alludes to that here in verse 19, calling it the prophetic word. And Peter then alludes to the New Testament scriptures in verse 12 when he speaks of the believers knowing and being established in the present truth. And uh, Peter, we saw in verse 15, was being sure. He said, I will be careful to ensure, to make sure that you always have a reminder of these things after my exodus, after I depart. Peter had an understanding, as did the apostles, that God was using them to give us a New Testament to be put together with the Old Testament to complete all that God revealed about who he is, his person, and his work. God, who is the author of salvation, has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, who is declared in the New Testament to be God, who is the Savior, who has provided that salvation in his shed blood and his glorious, victorious resurrection from the dead. And uh, Peter speaks of that here. Peter was uh, for sure referring to the Gospel of Mark, because as we hear from Papias, it's the uh, apostolic father Papias, who was an acquaintance of the Apostle John. Papias lived from 60 A.D. 
to 130 AD. That makes him a contemporary of the Apostle John, and apparently he knew the Apostle John. It is very difficult for us to know exactly all that Papias left because he did an exposition of the New Testament scriptures. But Eusebius had different ideas in mind. Well, I'm not going to get into church history. That's my, my point this morning. A lot of what Papias wrote has been lot to, lost to us today. And Eusebius counted Papias' ex eschatology as incorrect. That makes me very suspect of Eusebius. Papias' eschatology, which is merely the teaching of the scriptures on the end times, Papias' eschatology was that Jesus Christ was going to return to establish a 1,000-year kingdom on this earth. I know what book Papias was reading. This one. But Eusebius, who came along later, having embraced a different than a literal interpretation of the scriptures, embracing an allegorical interpretation of the scriptures, jettisoned this idea of a literal kingdom that Jesus was going to establish and uh, on it goes. The church fathers you have to be very, very careful about. Papias lived during the time of the Apostle John. Remember, John is writing uh, his book, uh, God's book, the book of Revelation, his final uh, piece of this New Testament scriptures, somewhere between 90 and 100 AD. That would mean that Papias was somewhere between 30 and 40 years old. And he was acquainted with John the Apostle. And it is Papias who says to us, and I quote, the elder, the Apostle John, used to say this also. Another quote. Mark, having been the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately all that he mentioned, whether sayings or doings of Christ. Not, however, in order. End of quote. And so Mark's gospel is exactly... Peter's accounting, as Peter alludes to here in verse 15 of chapter 1 of his second epistle, that there would be a reminder of these things after Peter's departure. And uh, Peter wrote, uh, dictated to Mark, John Mark, the same John Mark you read about in the Gospels, the same John Mark that Paul speaks about in Colossians chapter 4. That's who uh, wrote down as Peter dictated the events of the life of Christ as Peter recounted them. Peter was making sure that we have a reminder of these things. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, just before he returned to heaven, it is recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, commissioned 11 of the apostles that the Lord Jesus Christ handpicked himself to be his witnesses. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And how that promise of the Lord Jesus Christ has come to a tremendous fulfillment in the writings of the New Testament scriptures. Here we are today, 2022, and by God's grace, we will look at some of those events, and they are given to us by none other than the very apostles that Jesus handpicked and commissioned just before his ascension because they were to be his eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses of what? The fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. Eyewitnesses to what? The words and the works of Jesus Christ. Eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus is God who came in the flesh. Do you know that there is no one who has ever lived that has ever been anything like Jesus Christ? Not one. Jesus Christ presented to those 11, to you and me, and to everyone who will consider it, a tremendous paradox, a tremendous paradox, a paradox of every type and sort. How is it possible that this man, Jesus Christ, could be asleep in a boat while a storm was raging and they were in the midst of it on the sea, and yet... That saint, by the way, I've known one or two people that I think could sleep like that. Jonah comes to mind. Jesus is not the only one who slept on a boat 
in the midst of a storm. It, I, I can't fathom that, but it's possible. Extreme exhaustion obviously comes to mind in that kind of a picture, doesn't it? But that same, here's the paradox. That same man who was sleeping stood up, rebuked the winds and the waves, rebuked the storm, peace, be still. And there was a calm. And the likes of which these 11, there were 12 at that point, worshipped him. Even the winds and the waves obey this one. Do you know what a paradox is? A paradox is not a contradiction. It's an apparent contradiction. It's two things that seemingly contradict each other, but there's a truth that makes both possible. Jesus presented a paradox for these men, for anyone who will read and consider who he is. How is it possible that the man who spoke and created the heavens and the earth was laid so low by the scourge of a Roman soldier and the beatings at the hands of both the Jews and the Romans fell beneath the weight of the crossbeam that he carried out to Golgotha. What a paradox. And yet both are true because this man was no ordinary man. This was God who became flesh. Paul, a Peter, and I'm focused on Peter. Peter here in verse 16 focuses on this, and he wants the, all the hearers, all the readers of this second epistle to know that we, we, plural, we the eleven, and it would include one more, the Apostle Paul, again, handpicked by the Lord Jesus Christ, but handpicked after his resurrection and ascension, Saul of Tarsus, who became known as the Apostle Paul, to be one more, to be 12 men. We, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I proclaim to you this morning the testimony of the eyewitnesses of the majesty of Jesus Christ, because the child of God can have great confidence in the authority of the scriptures and can thus read, believe, and firmly establish your beliefs and your behavior in the truth of this book. You can do that with a tremendous confidence. How do you know? It was written, this is just one evidence, we'll look at some more in the coming weeks, but one evidence is it was written by the men who were there. Doesn't that comfort your hearts? How do you know? The things of which they wrote go beyond believability. It's a paradox. And there are many scoffers. There are many who scorn what is written in this book. But listen, it was written by men who were there. It was written by men who were there and died never changing their story. Thrust through with spears and swords, crucified, these men continued to proclaim these are the words of Jesus Christ. And there's never been a man like him ever before, and there never will be ever again. He is the Son of God, and I'm rejoicing to echo what these men told us, the Savior of all mankind the Savior. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. These 11 apostles handpicked by the Lord, uh, they are named in Luke chapter 6. You need not turn there. When it was day, Jesus called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Jesus named them apostles, apostle being one sent with a message. Did they have a message? What a message he sent them with. Jesus called them apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, the author of this epistle that we read. Simon, whom he called Peter. Andrew, his brother. James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus. Simon called the zealot. Judas, the son of James. And 
Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. He's not one of the 11. As I said, the 12th, the Lord Jesus Christ chose after his ascension the Apostle Paul. It's Paul himself who recounts to King Agrippa as Paul was in chains, accounted to Paul, uh, King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 that Jesus Christ said, Paul, I am now sending you to the Gentiles. In Romans chapter 11, verse 13, the Apostle Paul would announce that he was an apostle to the Gentiles, chosen not by men, but chosen by Jesus Christ himself to go forth with the same glorious message. And so, how did the Apostle Paul come to know Jesus Christ as his Savior? Well, he was a Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus. And Luke recounts Paul's own testimony in Acts chapter 9, Jesus in all his glory, might I say majesty, we'll look at that word in just a moment, Jesus in his majesty appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And Saul, who was seeking to imprison, persecute, and put to death any follower of Jesus Christ, heard these words when he asked a question. Being laid low and blinded by the majesty that belongs to Jesus Christ, Saul cried out, Who art thou, Lord? And then heard this answer, I am Jesus, the very one that you are persecuting. We might take a quick note that no one can touch a believer in Jesus Christ without touching Jesus Christ himself. That's how personal it is with God. If there is any voice that can hear me, any ear that can hear my voice is what I mean to say. If there is any ear that can hear my voice in any country around the world and you are persecuting believers in Jesus Christ, be it known to you, you will answer to Jesus Christ, the one you are persecuting. Acts chapter 9. Oh, repent as Saul of Tarsus did and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do you know he has a heart to receive anyone and everyone who will come to him in faith? He will receive you. Wow. This is the man that Peter is proclaiming to us. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The word for eyewitness here is the word that means to behold, to look at something and to see it. Peter uses this word a couple of times. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. 1 Peter 2, 12, Peter uses this word. I'll begin in verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they, what's the next word? Observe. That's our same word. That's our same word. It's just in the verb form. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, it's a noun. We are observers. We've ones who have observed. Eyewitnesses. They, these people who are uh, speaking ill against you, when they see your good works, they will observe and glorify God in the day of visitation. Why? Because they will have beheld they will have beheld the work of God in the life of a child of God in the way they live and act. They will observe it. That's the word. Look uh, with me at chapter 3, verse 2. Here, Peter's speaking in a very practical way to a wife who's a believer who happens to have a husband who is not a believer in Jesus Christ. And Peter giving very practical instructions in the first six verses says in verse 2 when they your unbelieving husband observe your chaste that is your pure conduct accompanied by fear the word observe is our same word to behold to see it's what you see Peter in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 says we observed and so we are eyewitnesses of what the majesty, the majesty that belongs to Jesus Christ, his majesty. The word for majesty here is uh, the Greek word megaleotes. 
And I think you can hear that word mega in the beginning, can't you? Big, great, megaleotes. The word, of course, just means greatness, magnificent. Webster, uh, Noah Webster, in his 1828 dictionary helps us with this word majesty, describing greatness of appearance, grandeur, the state of a person which inspires awe and reverence. Would you think with me just for a moment? What do kings do when they want to display their majesty? That is, when a king, an earthly king, wants to impress people such that they will be in awe of him. They will reverence him. Well, I don't know. You can just think about what kings have done, can't you? They wear expensive, costly clothing. They adorn themselves with jewels, whether it's crown or necklaces, gold and expensive gems. Isn't that what they do? We're going to see that Jesus Christ demonstrated, demonstrated the brightness of the glory of God to demonstrate his majesty. Do that. Kings will build a great army, don't they? If they want to impress people with their majesty, then they will have many who will come to their aid with arms to do whatever they call them to do. Very often when you walk into the royal court, you will see the retinue of those who stand on guard to impress everyone who comes into the presence of the king, I guess I could say or queen in our history, with the majesty. Do you know Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane to his disciples, he could call 10,000 angels the host of the heavenly army of angels of flaming fire would be able to instantly appear at the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's majesty. Some kings try to, with opulence in their architecture, to impress people with their buildings of magnificence. Solomon did that, didn't he? Tremendous buildings of magnificence. Do you know what Jesus said to his disciples recorded in John 14 just before he went to the cross? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. It will be the apostle John who in his earthly life would be caught up in a vision to heaven to see this place of magnificent glory and will record it in Revelation chapter 21 and verse tw chapter 22. You want to talk about glory and a glorious place. Is not the Lord Jesus Christ capable of demonstrating majesty, the magnitude and the likes of which no human king could ever begin to comprehend? Never mind, mimic. Oh, yes. And what did he do? It's a paradox what he did. It's a paradox. Jesus went to the cross and he laid down the very life's blood that he took so that you could know God and be saved. That's what this present truth records. Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day, that you through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ could be born again. What a paradox. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You see here from verses 17 and 18 that Peter is remembering the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter is also remembering the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, when Peter was first introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was as they were men, young men, but as they were men, Jesus being somewhere in our reckoning around the age of 30, according to the record of the Gospels. And Andrew, his brother, one of the 11, Andrew had heard the Lord Jesus Christ. He was introduced to Jesus, and he went to get Peter. Come see a man who told me everything. Is not this the Messiah? Is not this him? This was 
after Andrew saw John the Baptist identify Jesus with these words, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Peter, then coming, was introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in those early days before John the Baptist was imprisoned, had opportunity to hear and see and observe the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know how often, but on several occasions. But it was not until John the Baptist was imprisoned and Jesus began to now preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that the Lord Jesus Christ came by Galilee one day where Peter, James, and John were there fishing. And the Lord Jesus Christ said to set their nets aside, he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Luke's the one who records that early on, Jesus told them as they were out in the boats, not on the shore, he said, have you caught any fish? None, nothing. Cast your net on the other side of the boat. And when they obeyed the voice of the Lord, had such a catch, they had difficulty bringing it in, upon which Peter, when he got to shore, said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It made an impact on Peter's life, didn't it? Yes, Jesus went to Peter's home where Peter's mother-in-law lay faint with a fever, dying, and Jesus raised her up such that she then began to serve everyone. And by the way, there were lots of people during Jesus' earthly ministry who came because of the miracles that John would write in the opening of his gospel, and the word became flesh. The word, yes. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, the Word, is God the Son, and the Word became flesh. By the way, John also said in those opening three verses, and all things were made by him, and without him not anything was made that was made. He made it all, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John said these words, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you know that Jesus demonstrated his majesty, not only, as we'll see in a moment, by showing forth the effulgence of the perfections of his deity. He did that on the Mount of Transfiguration to Peter, James, and John, who were told, I do want you to tell others about this vision, but not until I rise from the dead. After my resurrection, those three men, and Peter records it here, will speak of the effulgence, of the perfections, of the divinity of Jesus Christ, the God-man. John writes, we beheld his glory, and John was speaking mostly of the miracles that Jesus performed, like when he filled that fisherman's net with fish after a night of no fish, no fish at all. Raising Peter's mother-in-law, from a fever that was taking her life, such that she could serve everyone who was there. John records of a man who was not only blind, John chapter 9, but he records of a man who never had sight, ever. Not just an accident or some disease, but he was born blind, never saw. Jesus gave that man eyesight. Have you ever thanked God for your eyesight? I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this le lesson, and I have to confess to you that when we gathered around our table this past week, there were lots of things I gave thanks to God for, but I didn't thank him for my eyesight. But after I studied and was preparing for this lesson, I thanked God for my eyesight. As imperfect as it is, I thank God for my eyesight. What a privilege to be able to see, isn't it? All the beautiful colors. This morning when I got up, the heavens were declaring the glory of God. I don't know if you saw the sunrise this morning. 360 degrees all the way around us was purples and pinks and reds and oranges. The sky was aflame with fire. And the heavens were declaring the glory of the creator who made them. And I was thankful that I had eyes to see it. The color. Are you thankful for your hearing? That you can hear? To hear the sound of a bird when it says, dee, 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 dee. 
All the different sounds that the birds make, the nutch hatch has its own sound. The eagle has its cry. The owl has its hoot. I go on except for time. The waves of the ocean as they lap upon the shore. The burbling and gurgling of a brook as it crashes over the rocks. Am I bringing anything to your mind? What a privilege it is to hear the hearing ear and the seeing eye. Gifts from God who created these things. These men both saw and heard. Jesus gave sight to a man who was born blind. Never saw until Jesus healed him. And you know what the disciples saw? The glory of God who has the power not only to bring into existence the things that we see, but has the power to overrule the bondage of corruption in which we live. Think about it. Peter writes here, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. John said, we beheld his glory. And in verse 17, God the Father did give honor and glory to his Son. We know that the glory of which God honored his Son was on two occasions. God the Father is recorded in the Gospels that when Jesus was baptized, spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And on that occasion, it is recorded that a dove, that is the Holy Spirit appearing as a dove, came down from heaven and alighted, rested upon Jesus Christ, God who became flesh and now was going to minister in the very power of God. That was an opportunity for everyone who was there to hear and to see God the Father honor the Son. And Peter ref refers to that in verse 17. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But Peter had an opportunity to see the effulgence of the glory of the deity of Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. Would you turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 is the recording of Peter when Peter made this known. It begins in verse 2 of Mark's gospel, chapter 9. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. That is, he changed his appearance, transfigured. Notice the description Peter gives us. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Peter, down by the shores, as he was counting and, and taking care of his fish, undoubtedly had seen some people washing their clothes or at some point and said, no one can get their clothes as white as the clothes of Jesus when he was changed before them on the mountain, showing the glory of God. There he was in his glory. Elijah, an Old Testament prophet. Moses, the Old Testament prophet. Appear. Old Testament saints. Are they lost? Is Elijah sleeping? Is Moses sleeping? No. Have they disappeared? No. Jesus is speaking with them on this mount. The Old, the Old Testament saints are alive and well in God's economy, waiting till God brings back his kingdom on this earth. Mm. And so they see Jesus in all his glory. But not only that, Jesus in all his glory, there's one more evidence. Verse 5, Peter, it's Peter, who speaks up and says, let's make three booths to honor Jesus Moses and Elijah, when God speaks from heaven, and in verse 7, a cloud overshadowed them, and it spoke. They heard God the Father, this is my beloved Son, hear him. Listen to what Jesus has to say. Listen to my Son. And notice, they became greatly afraid at the glory and the sound of the voice of God the Father from the cloud. Do you think Peter understood when he talked about the majesty of Jesus Christ. What a majesty for a father 
What an awe-inspiring thing for a father to come and say, this is my son. I want you to listen to him. That's what God the Father said about Jesus Christ to Peter, James, and John. And they understood it, and they embraced it. Yes, God the Father honored the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus honored the Father. On our way back to 2 Peter, turn with me to John chapter 14. No, go to chapter 8 first. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 29. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the multitude who were gathered there to hear him told them these words. I'll begin in verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And Jesus, in kind, responded by saying, everything that I do, I do to please God, my heavenly Father. Isn't that the perfect relationship? It's the perfect father-son relationship modeled by God the Father and God the Son. A wonderful example to believers in Jesus Christ that we honor our Heavenly Father doing all that we do because it's God's will. We want to please our Heavenly Father. Look at John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, in verses 48 through 50, as John records the conclusion of Jesus' public ministry before he begins to have a very private ministry together with the 11 in the upper room, Judas will be there at the beginning, but he'll go out to betray the Lord. In verse 48 of chapter 12, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. Jesus not only did, but he even said everything God the Father gave him to say. And so John will open up by saying, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And these are the words that the Lord Jesus Christ instructed his disciples to record, and you and I are blessed to have them today. Go back to Second Peter chapter 1. I will bring just a thought, maybe half a thought more, and we'll pick it up in Second Peter 1, verse 16, some more next week. This verse is packed with tremendous truth that should substantiate our faith and, and bolster our confidence in putting our faith in the words of this book, the Bible, God's holy word. One evidence of the truthfulness, one evidence of the truthfulness of this book is it was written by men who were there. They were there. They saw. They heard. They lived with the Lord Jesus Christ and recorded it for us. Why? Because the Lord wanted them to do that. I want you to notice, please, here, that the verse opened up. Peter said, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Cunningly devised fables. In our English, lang uh, English translation, the words cunningly devised are a translation of one word in the Greek. It's the word sophizo, sophizo. And we get our English word sophist. And sophistry, both of those words come from this Greek word. It's a verb, sophizo. We did not follow cunningly devised fables. It's put as an adjective here, but it's a verb used as an adjective. And it means to invent with wisdom. Tremendous amount of thought and thinking goes into what is presented. Today, a sophistry is usually something that's incorrect. And there's a lot of clever thinking that went into presenting something. Because when you're going to tell people a lie, you better at least dress it up. That's a sophistry. Now here, it just means the thinking. All the wisdom and thinking that went into it. But notice the next word, fable. 
cunningly devised fables. In the Greek, it's the word muthos, and we get our English word myth. Our English word myth comes from this word muthos that's translated fable. These cunningly devised fables. We did not use myths and fables that spent, we spent all this time thinking this up. Do you know that's exactly what people accuse the New Testament miracles of Jesus Christ? That's exactly what they accuse it of. These aren't true things. These aren't real. They're fables. They're myths. But wait a minute. Who wrote them? Eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses wrote them. Now, I will grant to you, I will grant to you that some people are so mentally ill that they might make up a fable and be willing to die. That's possible. But 11 men of character? No. No. Something different here. Now, why does Peter say that? We did not follow cunningly devised fables. We are going to find out in chapter 2, not only did false teachers accuse the disciples, the apostles, of doing that, they made up these fables. But they themselves spun fables. Yes, this word fables is again used throughout the new testament go with me quickly to titus chapter one can you find titus chapter one in verse 14 now this is the apostle paul as we noted earlier handpicked by the lord jesus christ after his ascension and he writes here to titus who is a pastor of the church at crete and gives him instructions, and in the midst of giving them instructions, tells them in verse 10 about many insubordinate, they don't obey, they're idle talkers and they're deceivers. Notice that they're especially of the Jews, those of the circumcision. Peter, um, Paul says to Titus, whose mouths must be stopped because of the effect that their uh, false teaching gives. Notice what Paul says about it. In verses 13 and 14, this testimony is true. That is the uh, 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 account that he gives in verse 12 of the Cretans, their culture, if you will, evil beasts, liars, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be what? Sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. That's our word, muthos, fables. Here came those who were spinning fables. Peter calls them cunningly devised fables. This well thought up idea of all these myths. And while they accuse Jesus of that, they do that very thing. Yet, if you go back with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter said, no, the fact of the matter is we are telling you exactly the truth. How do you know this is true, Peter? Peter. Because we were there. We were eyewitnesses. I'm telling you that what we beheld, what we had the opportunity to be a part of, was so amazing and so changed my life. I was never the same again, and I was willing to die. What I want to share with you this morning is that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can rest your hope firmly on the truth of God's word. You can do that with confidence. I'm telling you that you can live faithfully in the truth of God's word. You can do that. You can, with unreserved trust, adhere to the Bible as the very word of God. Why? Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, so that your faith and hope are in God. When you believe this book, do you know where you're placing your faith? You are placing your faith in God who made heaven and earth and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save you. There's no book like the Bible. There never has been. There never will be. This is God's word. Believe it. Obey it. Trust it. Search it diligently that you might know what it says. Memorize it that you might have it in your heart because if you have it in your heart, no one can ever take it away from you. And if they try to sever you from it, 
it says they will only usher you into the presence of the one who brought it forth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you left for us these eyewitnesses that you sent forth to proclaim and to record to be sure that we would always have a reminder of this present truth. I pray, Father, that we will open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears, that we would read, study, and memorize and place our faith firmly in the truth of the word of God. May your spirit guide us in understanding that we might live obediently to the truth of the word of God and find the blessing of God that these men found when they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen.